Hello, everyone. We will get started in just a moment. If Please introduce yourselves in the chat. Where are you calling in, tuning in from? And I will start. I'm in San Francisco. <laughs> Hi, Mary. In Delaware. Jennifer, good to see you. In Toronto, awesome. Trish, Trisha in Hillsborough, Oregon. Great. Please continue to introduce yourselves and I will uh, go ahead and describe the slides for anybody who is blind or low vision or on the phone. Oh, we have two folks from Hillsboro, Oregon. Do you know each other? Um, so I'll, I'll start here uh, with a code of conduct. Um, we have a code of conduct, be, be kind, practice radical inclusion. We don't tolerate, tolerate harassment. Um, Y'all are amazing. Please use the chat. Um, you can learn more at ally.cc slash COC. Um, my book is available. Uh, MelindaBriannaEppler.com. This slide shows an image of my book. Um, and Merlinda, now they're going a little too fast. Sorry, I told you to speed them up. Coming up next, our live event on May 3rd. Um, you can learn more at ally.cc slash RSVP. And this slide here shows um, lots of different diverse faces of the folks who have joined us over the years, along with my own, uh, holding a coffee cup and a computer and leading with empathy and allyship. The um, hashtag is allyship podcast. The link is ally.cc. And you can find us on most platforms, uh, podcast platforms. This is recognizing the impact of current events on our work lives with uh, Latricia uh, Frederick, Jared Side, and Melinda Brianna Epler. And it has images of all three of us, which we will describe ourselves in a moment. Uh, it's created by, this is created by Change Catalyst. And this slide has our logo in uh, black and red and the URL changecatalyst.co. And thank you to First Tech Federal Credit Union, their logo here in black on white, and ASL interpretation is by Interpreter Now, www.interpreter-now.com, also in black and white, on white, and uh, Sarik and Ruby are our interpreters. Great. All right, uh, I think we can take the slides down now. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. So welcome to our Change Catalyst live event series and the Leading with Empathy and Allyship show, where we have deep, real conversations about how we can be more inclusive in our workplaces and our communities. I'm Melinda Rihanna Epler, the author of How to Be an Ally and founder and CEO of Change Catalyst, where we build inclusive innovation through training, consulting, coaching, and events. So today's topic is recognizing the impact of current events on our work lives. And this is a crowdsourced topic, by the way, um, a highly requested topic from our sponsor and, um, and then also from, from feedback that we heard from you all, our audience. And I will say I like to be informed and to bear witness to what's happening in the world and the injustices that people experience. Many good allies do, right? And we also have a lot that's happening in the world, a lot of injustice, a lot of pain and violence. And I find that I take it in and it impacts me throughout the day, perhaps throughout the week, the month. I carry it with me in my body and my mind. And I do some practices to kind of work through that. Um, but right now, that what I'm carrying are brutal wars in Ukraine and Tigray and other areas of the world. And then anti-LGBTQIA plus legislation, anti-trans and anti-Asian and anti-Black hate crimes and other, other happenings that are in our lives, right? And I think we do a disservice to ourselves and each other when we go on through our life without end our work, without recognizing the impact that this has on us. So today we'll talk about our individual work to take care of ourselves, as well as the role of managers, companies, and allies to create safe, compassionate spaces for addressing our experiences. 
So I'm really excited to have two guests here to talk about us to talk about this with us today. Uh, we have LT Frederick, um, who is the director of people and communities at Cisco S Systems Incorporated. And I will say she's also family. She's my husband's cousin. <laughs> um, and then um, Jared Side, uh, executive director at Council Center for Council. Thank you both for being here and welcome. Thank you for having us. So um, to start, would you first um, please join me in describing ourselves for anybody who's blind or low vision? So um, I'll start. I'm a, a white woman with long red and some blonde stripes in my hair. And I'm wearing a bright blue shirt and my background is a, a sh short, uh, kind of a tall skinny bookcase on one side with a plant and some books. And on the other is my book, How to Be an Ally and an orange cover and some plants and a, and a painting. I will uh, describe myself, so Latresa Frederick, L, known as LT. I have on a leopard shirt um, and you might see white earbuds uh, coming from my ears. My hair is uh, black with a few curls and waves and I'm brown skin. Uh, so that's pretty much me. And my background is actually all white right now, just a white wall. And uh, my name is Jared Side. Um, I am a somewhat middle-aged um, white cis male um, with a pretty much bald head and some facial hair that would be generously described as salt and pepper, mostly salt, um, wearing a blue shirt with a black vest. I'm sitting in front of a bookcase filled with some wonderful teachings and um, musings from great teachers and wisdom carriers from all kinds of traditions that inform the work that I do and the life that I lead on a hat rack with the many different hats that I tend to wear in this life. Um, that's it. Fantastic. Um, the, also today we have ASL Interpretation by Ruby and Sarika from our wonderful partners, Interpreter Now, www.interpreter-now.com. And then Maggie from White Coat Captioning is doing a live captions today. So down at the bottom of your screen, you can adjust those um, captions however you like. The episode is sponsored by First Tech Federal Credit Union. Thank you so much to Sogol and the team for being a part of this work and the change that we are creating together. So LT and Jared, um, let's start first. Can you start by sharing a brief background about who you are where did you grow up and, and how did you come to do the work that you do today? So I, I will start. Uh, my name, again, Latresa Frederick. I grew up in a small town uh, in North Carolina. Uh, I'll claim the entire county. So it's Duplin County, uh, southeastern part of North Carolina. Um, and in a very small um, family of educators, uh, I am an African-American female who then went off to college at a large majority white institution, North Carolina State University in Raleigh, which was about an hour north of where I grew up. Um, and I was the beneficiary, if you will, of um, diversity development programs. So people that were trying to um, diversify corporate America. I was a, an inroads intern. Um, and benefited from lots of coaching and counseling around how to be um, professional, how to exist in a majority white world, particularly in a majority white corporate world, and what were the strategies and tactics to be successful in that environment. Um, and I've been, I uh, give a lot of credit to my parents and my family and my environment for raising me, but also to that program for existing to create the life that I have right now. Um, and so for that, it has been a personal passion of mine to give back and to help develop others um, and to also create space where others can be successful in environments where they may not have traditionally seen themselves. Thank you for that. That was really cool. I appreciate knowing all that and meeting the people. Thank you for for being here and sharing that way. I, um, so I grew up in uh, New York um, 
in the 70s and 80s, New York was a diverse and intimate, uh, extraordinary place where folks really found themselves on top of each other to a large degree. And so you couldn't help but feel all of the stories, all the diverse stories um, that you interacted with all the time. I think I developed a love of this kind of storytelling because everybody's story is so unique and you couldn't avoid it as you moved through New York in which we were so proximate. Uh, it was the era of the movie Fame, for those of you who are old enough to remember that, and that was um, many of the folks in my community. I started acting and I was directing, and so those were my kind of people. I went off to Brown University and then to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London, feeling that something about storytelling and about film and television and theater would be kind of what I could step into. Um, when I moved to Los Angeles, I realized that uh, <clears throat> authenticity was not as valued as I expected it would be. And that the work that I did that was most meaningful didn't pay very much, but the work that kept me alive was pretty inauthentic. And I found myself trapped in that kind of, well, if I'm gonna be a storyteller and I can't tell my story. And I think at this time, um, my daughter, uh, who um, was in an elementary school uh, just after the Rodney King riots were really traumatizing uh, Los Angeles, in particular South LA, um, as a concerned parent, as the president of the governing board, I watched that school turn into a really difficult and tense place. I watched my fourth grader kind of get scared to go to school and a lot of bullying and a lot of misunderstandings and felt something needed to be done. Um, as a parent, as a concerned uh, stakeholder in that school community, we found this practice of counsel that was being experimented with in Los Angeles schools as social emotional learning was being leached out of school budgets. There was less and less art and music and ways to connect. And this practice of just coming together and sharing our authentic story and finding a way to listen to each other felt so meaningful. And when we brought it in, it transformed that community. The community went from a place that none of us felt comfortable or safe really uh, trusting to the closest thing I'd seen to beloved community, this place where we may not come from the same place or even agree about things, but we really care about each other and what we're there to do, which was create a nourishing environment for the children. And I watched the, and the adults and the elders and then the kids in that community really open their hearts to one another through this practice of counsel. And I realized that the authenticity that I was missing in my career was really on display in building community in this place and decided I needed to change my life around. I needed to go that way. And so I learned what this was, what this practice of counsel was and went to work for the folks who were trying to bring it into other schools and beyond schools, community-based organizations and beyond that, correctional institutions, jails and prisons and then law enforcement and the corporate world and found that it was such an incredibly inspiring and uh, nourishing uh, work to be done around storytelling that heals and builds community uh, though it, it was not in the direction I thought it originally would be. And so Center for Council has become that organization that brings this practice out into the world in any number of ways. Thank you both. Thank you both for sharing. Um, I think that's just that sharing gets to the heart of some of this work too, right? Is, is that creating that space for, for people to share their authentic stories and how they got where they are, where they are now is the second piece. So, um, Let's dive into this. How would you recommend that we as individuals work to recognize what's happening in the world, protect our well being as we bear witness to the injustices and the pain in the world? Yeah, I think that we all have to first acknowledge that there is injustice in the world and that there is pain that many people are experiencing from various vantage, vantage points. Um, and sometimes we may be, are experiencing blind spots and are not aware of other people's pain or where they may feel um, that the world isn't quite fair to them. Um, and just listen, sometimes we just have to pause and be open to hearing or seeing someone else's perspective. Um, I know in my work, I, I work at a, a global um, IT company, extremely large, you know, 95 different countries that we, we operate in. And we have employees um, and team members that are in 
countries that may per be perceived to be at, at odds, right? But there's still people that are within these different countries and these different um, spaces. And everyone may not have the same uh, values or principles, but we often will have things that are in common that we do care about one another in different ways. And oftentimes have already found common ground in which we can work and, and partner together. And so I think it's really important for us as individuals to think about where do we experience pain, experience pain and how do we um, like for others to engage with us in that moment and then mirror that back and think about how can we be a supportive force to another. Um, but I'd love to, Jared, I know you have lots of thoughts on this one. I'd love to hear what, what you'd have to say on that. Well, I so appreciate what you're saying, LT, and I 100% I agree with you. Um, yeah, the, 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 the current moment is um, just very perilous. Um, there is so much happening right now with wars and violence and oppression and subjugation and sickness and inequity, mm -hmm. not to mention our own personal lives that are filled with trauma and and drama, uh, all of which is very consequential to each one of us. And, and, and the reality is um, all we can impact is this present moment. That is really the only impact we can have is right now. Um, I think um, we are unfortunately ineffective in changing the past. We can't really, unless we have a time machine, we can't go back and change something. So all of the time we take unpacking and replaying and watching again, all of this trauma, re-traumatizing ourselves and others by, by getting stuck in that story of the past, we, we're not really effective in doing anything about it. Similarly, the future that we fantasize and dread about you know, that we are constantly kind of fixated on is not something we can actually know until we get there because things are always changing. The only thing we can do the only place we can be truly effective is right here in the present moment as we prepare and resource ourselves such that we can meet each moment, including those that will come in the future and become our present moment in a good way. And there's a great deal we can do to bring online uh, skillful means of regulating our nervous system, of training our attention. Um, I think the ability to resource ourselves now is so critically important in how it is we navigate through because you know, this current moment is all we have. It is truly the only place where we can do any real work. And I think uh, staying current and present is critical for our health, our physical, mental, emotional, spiritual health, um, for our productivity in terms of collaboration and creativity and engagement in our work, um, and also for making the world a place that we want to, you know, bring the next generation into. We have to focus on how it is to show up in the present moment. And I think we can become more conscious of the way um, our bodies are impacted by the stressors um, and uh, the perceived threat and how it is that we get activated or dysregulated, you might say, with our sympathetic nervous system kind of going crazy in this fight, flight, freeze mode, which is really effective if you know a bus is barreling towards you and you gotta run away or a wild animal is attacking your child, you know, we need to respond. But when the threat is not imminent, all of the stuff our physiology is doing to prepare us to fight or flee or freeze isn't really effective. It just kind of holds us in the trauma. And so skillfulness around working with the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, you know, uh, cyclicity that is so necessary and bringing about practices that bring us back into our, into our bodies, into our right mind, so to speak, and into the present moment are really important for each one of us individually, as well as the groups that we work in um, to provide resources and, and to uh, um, help us prepare in a good way. We are unfortunately really uh, often um, you know, ill-prepared and unresourced in a world that is so challenging. And that's, uh, that's a miss. And that really is something that I think we can do a better job of individually, organizationally, and as far as community is concerned. Yeah, it also makes me think of, of building muscle memory. Right. When you when you get in the habit of building skill, skill building personally, how do you take a moment to pause and breathe and reflect and rejuvenate? Like, do you build the routine of almost like you, you're raising a child? Do you teach them those behaviors of what do you do when you get out the bed? Right. 
to take your shower, to brush your teeth, to wash your hands, Mm -hmm. like building the skill of resiliency and building the skill of pouring back into yourself, but making it a habit to do that, uh, I think is really important for us as individuals. And then we are able to then pour into our teams and, and, and lead appropriately. You know, you remind me of something that maybe it's the, the pattern on, on your blouse. I'm, I'm thinking there, there's this wonderful uh, book by um, Robert Sapolsky called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Not that it looks like a zebra, but there's this very interesting observation around the fact that human beings don't have that muscle memory of how to shake it off. Zebras, however, you know, if you're on the savanna and you see the, you know, the, the lion getting ready for lunch, zebras know like, uh oh, stop eating. We got to run. We got to find safety. You know, poor, you know, zebra who's slow is going to wind up being lunch for the lion, but the rest of us are going to get to safety. And when we get there and realize it's safe, you know, zebras have this thing where they shake like this. They do a little shake and they shake it off mm. and they know how to do their bodies, show them a way to downregulate from that stress state. And I think, you know, if you have dogs and dogs get into it, you notice dogs sneeze. They're like, ksh, ksh. there's this way in which bodies take care of themselves when we move from stressful states to rest and, you know, uh, collaboration and discernment and relational spaces and human beings you know, don't have that sort of ingrained pattern and don't have something like the zebra shake dance that we know how to do to to move. And we need to be taught that. We need to learn those skills. And they're critically important because if we stay in this state of, you know, watching the news and hearing the stories and reliving the traumas, you know, the the cortisol and the adrenaline and all all, all that is that the sort of sympathetic tone is characterized by is really damaging to our health in the long run. And it's absolutely... um, you know, prohibitive in terms of making relationships, collaborating, being productive and creative at work, all of these things that we, you know, we need and want to be relationally and in terms of our work life and in terms of our health um, really can't exist unless we, we, we teach ourselves how to move and create the cyclicity between this sympathetic and parasympathetic tone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking, of, um, and I'm not a pr- practitioner on this, but w- some of the things that I have learned is just, you know, shake it, that shaking, shake one hand, shake the other hand, shake one foot, shake the other foot, and you can do it faster and faster. Kids are taught this in, in, um, as, you know, when, when there's um, heightened anxiety um, to, to let it go in preschools and, and early uh, education. So that's one that I use. And then I also do yoga to kind of move it through in a different way, very different way. Are there other things that you would recommend? Yeah, first, I think part of it is also starting to understand yourself. So being aware of when, when are you, I, I hesitate to use the word trigger, but when are you sometimes triggered? Like, can you check mm-hmm. in? Do you know when, when something is bothering you? Do you? Can you feel it inside of your bones that, ooh, I'm not, I'm not in a good place. And uh, my colleagues know, I, I told them, I said, oh, I feel a little snappy. Like I know I'm Mm. maybe snapping at people a little more. It may be time for LT to take a time out. Like I Mm. might need to just step away for a couple of hours um, or maybe I'm going to take a couple of days here and there. So just recognizing some of the things that might be happening with you personally, um, I think is really important. Things I personally do, I, I love a vacation. And in the pandemic, that has been one of my greatest challenges is not being able to fly off to an island or just get up, you know, get on a plane and go somewhere. But I found um, staycations in my own way. So I took some days one time and took my camera and went to a flower garden. And I just literally took pictures of flowers Um, and, you know, nice walks, a hot bath. Um, It can be high or low budget, if you will. Um, But just taking the time to pause and do something that you personally enjoy is important. But I also want to caution not to just close everything off and forget about it. Close everything off for a moment, but don't don't lose sight of the fight um, or investing where where you can and where you would like to invest. So I know we'll probably get to that later, but I just wanted to to bring that up as well. You know. I think that you had me at LT is feeling snappy. 
because I think that this this is you know this is self awareness, and what it does when you're able to reflect in this way is you're activating your prefrontal cortex. You are actually being self reflective in this moment. The way in which we can interrupt this sympathetic you know, hyper arousal is to bring online the parasympathetic nervous system. And yes, there are things like shaking and yes, there are absolutely you know, uh, steps we can take and mindfulness practice and meditation and yoga. And these things actually activate this nervous system, including everything we do with our prefrontal cortex, you know, counting. You know, we were told as kids, you know, you're upset, count to 10. Well, counting is abstract thought. You know, one, two, you know, lizards don't count. Human beings count. We have a prefrontal cortex that gives us things like abstract thought and holding, you know, um, visions of the future and relationality. We, we don't make a lot of sense when we're tense. And when we have a practice, um, counsel is an incredible opportunity for a group to come together. And, you know, what's your word? Is it snappy? Is it relaxed? Is it chill? Is it exhausted? How do we look into ourselves, search inside ourselves and come up with a word? And when I say my word, what's that reaction, you know, in you when you hear the words of 20 of your colleagues who are snappy, overwhelmed, exhausted, you know, how do you understand the world around you when you are witnessing people telling their authentic story? This speaking and listening in this kind of authentic way is a great way to activate the parasympathetic nervous system and to come back to this kind of balance. And I think ways in which we scan the body, ways in which we consciously breathe deeply, ways in which we reflect and then can create a kind of relationality are critical kind of tools for coming back to this kind of more effective way to be with one another. There are, there are definitely interventions. And when a, you know, a staff meeting or a faculty meeting or even a family meeting starts with people taking a breath, slowing down, reflecting on how mm -hmm. it is that you're doing, saying a couple of words and listening to everybody else in the circle say a couple of words, you are doing just what you need to do to bring yourself back into coherence and into a place where you can be more relational and more productive. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I want to pause for a moment and say thank you all for your for your comments in, in the chat. Great, some great stuff in there. Um, and we will uh, take some time for Q and A at the end. Um, Madeline, I see your question. I think we're going to answer it in just a moment. Um, but if you have questions, please put them in the Q and A too, so so we don't lose them in the chat. And uh, thanks for continuing to share. This is great. So let's let's jump. It was well. I think it's so important as a part of allyship to recognize that this impact, what this impact has on us. I'm feeling snappy. That means I need to take a break and not um, potentially, you know, cause we know that when we're more stressed, when we're more activated, we're more likely to activate our biases. So we're more likely to activate microaggressions and, and to hurt each other unintentionally. And so that is a key, key piece of all of this. And the other piece is, is having that compassion for each other and that knowing that we're all, in some way, we're all going through something. And, and so I wanna kind of move into what, um, what we can do as colleagues and, and for managers, what managers can do as well. And, and I do think that maybe we could jump in a little bit more into the practice of counsel, Jared, if you could share a little bit about what that is, what that looks like and how that might be useful. Sure. Um, it's probably a much longer conversation, but I, I will say that counsel is a way to come together authentically and to offer regard. That's kind of simply what it is. The word counsel comes from the Latin concilium, which is a, a Latin word. It was a word used by Benjamin Franklin, who was a white European Judeo-Christian Latin informed dude who watched the, the Haudenosaunee folks practicing in ceremony and through his Latin based lens called this concilium because it was a gathering of people. Um, as I have traveled and worked in other places, a practice like this is called Ibiramo in Rwanda and Fambultak in Sierra Leone and mm -hmm. Dare in other parts of Africa. It's called Ho'oponopono in Hawaii and Diwan and Laya Jirga in Islamic traditions, Ma'agal Hakshava in uh, Israel and in Hebrew tradition. We have an incredible human desire to come together to be a community, to offer regard to one another and to find our authentic voice and counsel is a practice that codifies steps we can take to do this in our time, in our organizations, in our companies. There are five basic elements of counsel 
to just boil it down to the nuts and bolts. There's a circle and a center and a threshold and intentions and a, and a closure. We need to know who's there. So we need a circle so that everybody gets a good seat and there's no VIP section and nobody um, has any kind of privilege above any, anyone else when we're all sitting in a circle. Every seat is a good seat mm -hmm. and we know who's there. There needs to be something that really embodies that which is common to all of us, our common values. Maybe it's a, something beautiful like a flower or a glass of water, or maybe it's the product our team is producing or the service we're offering. Maybe it's a stethoscope if it's a bunch of doctors practicing, something that reminds us of something important to us, sits at the center and represents our common ground. This threshold at in council, the practice of council, is an opportunity for us to step in consensually. You know, this is not a coercive process. We need to decide we want to interact with one another in this way, in a different kind of way, step away from the craziness and the overwhelm and the speed and all the drama and the multitasking to be together in a different kind of way and to practice intentions. And the intentions are really to speak and to listen to one another from the heart. It's a, it's a simple thing to say, it's not an easy thing mm -hmm. to do. Um, the practice of listening from the heart really asks us to set aside everything we think we know about the person who is speaking so that we don't have to agree or disagree or analyze or take a stance. You know, we so easily listen to the sound of the wind blowing through the trees or the, the, the waves when we walk along, you know, the coastline. And, you know, when you listen to the waves, you, you learn something about the surf. You don't have to agree or disagree with the waves. You don't have to agree or disagree mm -hmm. with the cow in the meadow. And yet when we're with other people, we make a series of judgments and put them behind a series of filters such that anything they have to say becomes filtered through uh, an aperture that is increasingly tight. When we listen to each other the way we listen to nature, there's something about showing up with curiosity and open-heartedness to understand rather than to judge or to analyze or to fix. And I think that's the critical piece. Similarly, when we speak, if we can actually give words to what's here right now, what's alive and present, not the thing we think we should say, or we always say, or the thing that we think is gonna accomplish the task or convince you of something or scare you or seduce you or whatever, but just to say what's really present for us. This is um, intentionality in council. And then finally in council, we need to step away from this time together in a good way, such that what we've done is done. Uh, the agreements we made, the contract, like your slide at the beginning of this conversation that sort of kind of sets out the agreements. We know we're stepping away from that space and our life may be filled with circumstance where we cannot maintain those agreements. So we need to step away in a good way and know we can always come back. And so those sort of five elements are what the practice of council looks like. It could be 10 minutes, 15 minutes, it could be 45 minutes, it could be hours, depending on what you decide to do with this container. But for each group that feels that it's an important way to come together, it can be extraordinarily generative and adapted such that we can show up in a good way and offer each other this beautiful quality of regard, this permission to be present, to be actually alive in this moment, to bear witness to what it is, to feel the way we feel, and to understand in some kind of way, recognizing how everyone else in this circle has showed up, uh, and in that to be able to offer nourishment to each other. It's, it seems like a very simple process, but it is extraordinarily um, affirming um, and relationship building. And through this kind of activity, there's a kind of a trust that is built in this vulnerable space of telling our story, not our deepest, darkest secrets, not the, you know, the story from Adam, not this kind of like big narrative, but just present, you know, uh, speaking the story of the moment um, that can be um, a really beautiful uh, contribution to any community that's wanting to create greater cohesion and cooperation. That's a lot. I'm sorry. I just took a deep dive there, but I hope that that explains it some kind of way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, LT, can you, thank you for sharing that. And, and, and I think it gets, gets to a lot of really important ways that we all need to, we all can show up for each other. And, and, and develop those safe spaces for each other to be vulnerable, to be authentic, to share, um, and you know, to step in and have courage, right, to do that. Um, LT, do you have thoughts about how um, managers and, um, and, and colleagues in general um, can really show up for each other and create these safe kind of vulnerable spaces for, for the exploration? 
For sure. Um, there are a couple of things that we have done both on a programmatic level as well as more team-based. Um, one of the, the areas that I'll call out is uh, a, a session or a program where we will have team leaders with a, a third party facilitator come together to build trust and focused on being vulnerable and using your voice to create space where others are willing and open for sharing. Um, maybe what's going on with them, maybe um, a, a phrase that we use quite often is the elephant in the room. So the, the big thing that's right there in front of us that no one really wants to talk about, um, is there someone that's willing to uh, be courageous and maybe break the ice and say, you know what, we're really dealing with this one thing that's holding us back as a team. Can we talk about it? Um, can we lean into it? Or, uh, you know, I might be very reserved and we create this space where the leader will initiate the conversation and share where they've had to take a risk and lean into a conversation that maybe is not as comfortable as others. Um, one of the things that comes to mind is um, when there were some of the police shootings that became more public, um, our leadership team joined one of our EROs just to listen in and hear the conversations around what people were feeling and experiencing and the concerns they had about, um, you know, teaching their child the rules of how to drive and be cautious of how to engage with the police. And what, were, what would happen if my son was in a car with your son and my son was the driver and what happens um, or how should my son engage differently if he's of a different race mm -hmm. or a, of a, a targeted race. Um, so we just started having live conversations um, and, and making it okay to have a conversation. I think, you know, when I think about the global teams one of the things, especially right now with uh, the war in, in Ukraine and Russia is we have team members that are in both locations. Mm -hmm. um, again, serving the, the greater good for our company um, and are unfortunately, they are being pitted against each other, not by us, but by the universe, if you will, right? Um, and so what are we doing? We're asking our team leaders to check in with the individual, stay close, you know, how are they doing? What can we do to support them? Just leaning in to say, we're here for you. If nothing more than just to chat or just so you have a safe place that you know that you can have a connection with another person. And it's been beneficial for all because not everyone agrees with what's happening. Many people, you know, have uh, varied opinions um, about what's happening right now. And so we wanted to just make sure that our team members know that we as a, a culture and a community and a company care about them as individuals and what, they're, what they do for us. Um, and so there are other, many other things that we're doing company-wide, but as a leader, as a people leader, the best thing that you can do for your team members is to just check in check in, connect, give them attention, allow them to connect with their peers. But that attention piece is the piece that's the most powerful for creating space where people feel safe, that they, they know that you have their back. Um, so that's what I would offer. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm reminded of a, of a podcast I heard many, many years ago when Joshua Dubois, who was the head of um, then community organizer Obama's faith-based initiatives before he was even a senator. Uh, he talked about how um, Obama had this incredible ability to bring people together and ask them to tell their story mm -hmm. as opposed to their opinion. And when you had a group of people telling a story about how they've been impacted by healthcare or by the military you know, experience of being overseas, you can't disagree with somebody's story. You, know, you can disagree with their opinion, but it's just a question of either listening or not listening to their story. If you can get them to the place where they're sharing their stories. And I think presencing uh, real stories, authentic stories, can't help but generate resonance. And when we experience that resonance, something happens that the that, that presence that regard, um, I think it becomes a kind of an antidote to this tribalism and the sense of us versus them. When all of a sudden I'm resonating with a true story that someone else has said. And I think that further that the culture of the workplace either inhibits or encourages 
uh, how much of us we are we understand to bring. We either um, receive these sort of cues and signals that it's okay to show up or not. And I think these kind of um, opportunities to come together and offer this uh, quality of vulnerability sends really powerful signals that this is a place where who you are is valued and welcome. And through that vulnerability, we create trust. It's often thought that it's the other way around. We gotta trust each other before we can be vulnerable. And it's actually, um, as many studies have found, and there's some wonderful books on this, including one by Daniel Coyle called uh, The Culture Code, that you know vulnerability when practiced leads to trust. And these belonging cues that we signal to one another through mm. telling stories that give a little bit of ourselves invite others into this space and create an environment where we become more invested and more connected and more creative and more sort of focused on how we as a team you know we can move forward together as allies mm-hmm. mm. um uh, lt you, you uh, just to, just for anybody who doesn't know ero i assume that's employee resource organization yes that's yeah. exactly right okay thank you <laughs> so Affinity groups within a, a, a corporate setting, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it, it, I think it's important. So many managers and colleagues, um, just in, in general, people who want to be allies, I think get stuck in the fear of saying or doing something wrong, and so they don't do or say anything at all. Yeah. And it's so important, and what you both have said, you don't have to have all the answers. It's about showing support. It's about showing and sharing vulnerability and sharing stories. And you start there, that's, 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 the, that's how you build trust. That's how you um, get at some of the deeper issues um, as well and, and really build those connections on your teams. Um, I, I wanna <clears throat> just bring up that I'm a, I'm a fan of the podcast. And um, when you had uh, Dr. Virginia Ming on, it was really interesting to hear her take on um, the preference we have to be with like people and the fear we have of people who we perceive to be unlike mm-hmm. and how not only is that limiting, but it's potentially dangerous. Um, when we start seeing the thems and the uses, I think it leads nowhere good. I've, I've practiced and, and taught in Rwanda and Bosnia and in at Auschwitz and generationally folks carry what it has meant to be the result of a long and awful history of using and theming. And I think, mm. you know, what, what Dr. Ming talks about is the need for our counter stereotypical exemplars, which is a beautiful term and how we enact that, how we create the space to not just like read someone else's opinion, but truly sit with them and hear their story in such a way that it really moves us and touches us. We realize that that person who we think we're nothing like, and I've had this experience in prison with, you know, folks serving life sentences and with, you know, folks with politics and life experiences very different from mine. But hearing them talk about a grandma or hearing them talk about a beautiful sunset or a time they met their best friend or if they had a superpower, what it would be or their favorite kind of cheese and why they love it so much. There's something about the the authenticity in the story that brings you closer to them on a human to human level. And there's so much we can do if we're skillful about getting to those human stories that begin this trend away from uh, how it is we kind of create our in-group and then not only distrust the out-group, begin to um, think things and do things and create things about that out-group that lead nowhere good. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a danger and we have to practice in such a way that we break that all down. I think council is a wonderful opportunity to bring this uh, practice of um, storytelling, of group mindfulness, um, such that mm-hmm. we can presence the real stories of each other. And, and yeah. you create this this bigger in group, right? The the whole the whole circle is the in group there. Yeah. Yeah. It, oh, it and, makes and me also think of like, uh, sorry, uh, um, curiosity and 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 common interests. Um, and I think part, you know, you started with the fear component. Um, I think there's is so much. I mean, there's. I, I should be able to to quote the the uh, the research. I can't go it go all the way there, but. When we think about um, our natural inclination, we, you know, scientifically, you you typically go towards things that are most like you, right? Um, and that is passed down in a number of different ways. And you have to actually be intentional about being curious in order to change that natural motion. 
Um, and it's really important for us to think about how is the world evolving? How are our societies evolving? And what's the impetus for change versus continuing to do what you've always done, to know what you have always known or to, to do what you think is the right thing to do based on history versus based on the future and where, where you need to go and to evolve personally. So I think there's something there around um, being intentional about being curious versus doing it because someone told you to do it or because it's, you know, to check a box or to not be classified as someone who's not an ally. If I, if I could just say, I think uh, you're so right on it. And, you know, my, my, my book is called Where Compassion Begins. And I feel like it's really important to understand that compassion is not the same thing as pity or sympathy or even empathy. You know, we have to understand that we can say, oh, well, poor you, that story, you know, really sucks. Or we can say, you know, okay, hear you. But until we take action, until we understand that compassion is not how we feel, compassion is what we do. And when we are moved by the story of another, where we see somebody actually feeling something and we are compelled to take action that eases that suffering, that is where compassion emerges. And, and it's not something that can be taught. You know, you can create these opportunities for folks to show up and have an opportunity to speak and, and really allow yourself to experiment with curiosity and with vulnerability. When we are putting ourselves in that place, we give ourselves the opportunity to say, you know what, I think I can actually do something here because I've heard the call for something. In that moment of activation around what it is that happens to us when we feel that someone is in pain or someone is in need is where we get to embody compassion. And it doesn't come because we like something on Facebook or because, you know, mm. the C-suite issues, you know, an edict about DEI. It doesn't come because somebody sort of constructs it. It comes because we enact it. And so these steps of showing up of downregulating, of really opening to what's there, of bearing witness, allowing ourselves to be moved and touched, and then taking action. That's where compassion arises. And that's what is going to, I think, make the world a better place, as well as keep us healthier and more connected and more productive. Mm. I would agree. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to uh, uh, um, just with the audience, if you have other questions, please do put them in like the Q and A. And and uh, Padma mentions that counseling workshops dealing with mental health um, regularly organize and when they're regularly organized in an organization where people feel free to open up to be vulnerable about the issues and to share their experience, it goes a long way in restoring that trust and that faith uh, in workplaces. Um, what does what does vulnerability look like? How do you practice that? Yeah, for me, I, I would like to say that vulnerability looks like courage. It looks like taking a risk. It looks like sharing beyond uh, what I call the surface. Um, we often will do an exercise that um, we call, if you knew me, if you knew me, you would know that I'm a you know, Southern girl from North Carolina. If you really knew me, you would know that while I'm a Southern girl from North Carolina, I hate the outdoors because it's really sticky and hot and North Carolina has you know, all kinds of humidity, right? If you really, really knew me, you would know that the spring can sometimes, while it's a, you know a time of awakening, it's kind of sad for me because it's the time that reminds me of when I lost my my mother, right? Peeling the onion and getting more and more open, but into a deeper space. Personally, I might feel like I'm taking a risk because you might be ju judging me about how deep I've gone or what I shared, mm -hmm. and that's where the fear comes in. Are you going to now not want to invite me to your spring party because you know that it's a triggering moment for me because of something I shared, mm. right? Um, and so vulnerability is sharing anyway, giving yourself the permission and the space to lean in and for you to also invite anyway, knowing that you may not get the response that you're looking for, but it's okay because together we're gonna to figure out what works for us. 
And and I, I love that example. It's so beautiful. I, I think that it's important to point out that, uh, you know, vulnerability um, leads to higher group functioning. It leads to cooperation and creativity and accountability and productivity. There are ways that we are able to increase our trust of one another and our ability to work together. And, and I'm going to go back to this, this great book by Daniel Coyle, you know, teams that are highly productive often have a culture in which these kind of conversations, these kind of activities that LT was talking about are encouraged and practiced on a regular basis. It's hard to do it first day, you know, in the door and everyone's talking about all this weird touchy-feely stuff. Obviously you don't wanna jump in too deep, too quick and not scare anybody off. And there is a skillful way to move towards this and to build it in any kind of team. We, you know, have worked in situations where folks are really open to this kind of connection and we work with law enforcement officers and military folks and, you know, doctors and heads of departments who are really used to being behind that white coat. This white coat means I have all the answers. There's no vulnerability mm -hmm. here. If you look to me for something, I'm going to give you the answer. You depend on me to, for that. And I am absolutely not going to show you that I'm terrified. And I don't know what to say to you at this moment. This, this role I'm playing, I have come to feel means that I need to be absolutely secure in my expertise, which is not a human condition. None of us is that secure. And yet what happens when we take off that white coat? I, I worked with a bunch of judges in chambers at lunchtime who were dealing with human tragedy all day long um, in the cases they were seeing. And at lunchtime, when they took the robes off and there was an opportunity to talk about something they feel really proud of and, and was a triumph and something that keeps them up at night, all of a sudden a group of human beings who had you know, seen each other in the hallways for oh, decades, all of a sudden met each other as human beings and realized I had no idea that that human quality was underneath that robe. And it's the same wherever mm -hmm. we go. And it's been, you know, I think that a lot of what LT was saying is echoed um, by, by Brene Brown and talking about courage and vulnerability. And, you know, I, one of the things she does with groups is to ask people to think about an act of courage and then think about whether there was any vulnerability involved in every act of courage that we are taught to respect and hold up as important. There is always an element of vulnerability and yet we are not trained in this. It's not normed as something that's welcome in the workplace. It's something there's a lot of stigma around. And so we're missing a critical component in terms of our ability to meet the world, to meet you know, conflict and, and overwhelm and do it in a way that we can support one another and that's real. And I think that when a team develops the capacity to really function and work with those kind of um, kind of peer to peer kind of uh, unburdening, um, there's an enormous amount of nourishment in that. And there are cases when you know acute mental health intervention is necessary. That's the C O U N S E L, the counseling that's counseling. But counsel is a gathering of people where we just have a space to share a story. And in that, you know, your story of you know, the terrible day you've just had and the wonderful day you had last week is going to make me feel like I'm not alone, that somebody is carrying something similar to what I'm carrying. And that's going to be a relief. And then when I tell my story, the same kind of reciprocity will be there. And I think that's a, a beautiful way to enhance the culture of an organization. And, you know, invariably people bring it home and all of a sudden a family is talking to each other in a way that they haven't before because they've given each other permission. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a, a good... A, a good thing for all of us to do, to give our each other permission and to give ourselves permission to, what is it, to ask, ask that question, what is, what is that robe that we're wearing? What is that, that armor, Brene Brown um, talks about, what is that cloak that we, that we have and, uh, and to peel that, peel that away like an onion. Um, yeah. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, Madeline asked earlier, what are some of your favorite small acts to offer compassionately to somebody else? Um, and she was asking specifically about managers. What, what are some of the ways that small acts managers can um, share and show compassion? Yeah, I think, you know, simple things like check, again, I go back to my check-in piece, but how are you doing today? Not just how are you doing, but make it real and more concrete. How are you doing today? Um, you can acknowledge, you know, something that might have happened and relate it to that person's community. I know, you know, we just saw um, really challenging confirmation hearings, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, for me, right? And 
Um, I, it may be triggering. I was just wondering how, how are you doing LT? What's, you know, what are your thoughts? Maybe I want to engage, maybe I don't, but at least acknowledging that there's something there gives, creates the space where your employee can engage with you. I think also small tokens of recognition. Um, sometimes we wait until the project finishes for the big bang. Um, and sometimes you can just acknowledge the milestones as we as you go um, and make sure to do that for all of the team members. And one thing, one example that comes to mind for me, watching March Madness um, with Coach uh, Dawn Staley on Monday when, I think it was Monday, when they won the, uh, the championship, the, the Women's National Championship, one of the first groups of people that she acknowledged or thanked was the third string on the basketball team. Third, for those that don't follow basketball, it's the, the group of people on the team who likely didn't get to play in the actual basketball game on the, on the day, on the main stage. But they were critical components of preparing the entire team for the day. That's the team that people are practicing with and against and you know, challenging with different drills. But she made it a point, she made it a very specific point to acknowledge those team members because they contributed to the overall good of the whole. Um, and I think sometimes we forget that and we might forget, you know, those who might be the quietest on the team or some of our minorities or people who are remote versus in the same office. Um, so there's so many different ways to acknowledge people's existence and just leaning in and taking a moment again to pause, see who's there and acknowledge everyone's contributions in their own ways is really powerful. Mm. Yeah, Madeline adds here, I think we also serve well being, well being by having spaces to practice gratitude and share something an individual is proud of. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left, um, Jared, we have one more question and maybe you could just come in, in a really short answer. Um, please, can you elaborate on the impact of counting and abstract thinking? Because I do that subconsciously since childhood. So many um, practices of mindfulness ask us to be present in the moment. We don't realize that the prefrontal cortex, which is a critical part of our parasympathetic nervous system, is doing all of these abstract thought exercises. This is the capacity to speak, to you know, hold ideas, to scan our body, to think about how we're being. What's the word? Is it snappy? Is it calm? Is it exhausted? This self-reflective kind of process is contained in that part of our anatomy that shuts down when we're stressed. Sympathetic arousal means that parasympathetic tone is lowered. So when we do these things, we actually raise the capacity to navigate stress. There are ways that we can just focus on the breath coming in and out. There are ways that we can think about how our toes and our feet and our ankles and our calves, we can body scan. There are ways that we can um, check in with one another and hear the stories of each other. All of these activate this prefrontal cortex and in doing that interrupt this sympathetic overload. And I think there's a lot to read about this and I, I would recommend folks do it. The important thing is that mindfulness, meditation, yoga, practicing in council actually is a great um, resource for bringing mm -hmm. about this kind of tone that interrupts this current and constant and chronic stress state. Fantastic, thank you. Um, it, and we will share some of the resources that we discussed today, the, the episode with Dr. Vivian Ming and several of the other resources that we that we talked about um, in our show notes uh, coming out of this, uh, this session. So um, stay tuned for that. And, Thank you, Jared and LT, so much um, for your wisdom, for giving us so many things to think about and ways to connect with each other at a deeper level. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for so everything much. you do, Melinda. It's good to meet you, yeah. LT. Thank you for what you, you do. You too. Thank you. You too. And thank you to everybody in our audience for your presence, your chats, and your great questions. Um, and much gratitude again for First Tech Federal Credit Union for your partnership too. If you want to check out our past episodes, visit ally.cc, and we will see you all next week. All right. Thanks, everybody.